wanted to let you know that tonight's teaching will be in 3D. <laughs> now, before you start asking the ushers for your own set of fashionable 3D glasses, let me explain. See, I'm guessing we've all been here to at least one 3D movie in our life, right? There's some out right now. And last year, Lynn and I went to a couple, and we went with friends to a 3D movie there at the IMAX Theater, if you've ever seen that. 60-foot screen, five stories high. And we walked away from that day just amazed. You know, even better than the real thing there. And I got this pair of glasses right here. I didn't steal them. They said we could take them. I'm just letting you know. But, as you know, if you've been to a 3D movie, you know that 3D makes any picture a little bit more personal, right? It's the images there jumping right off the screen and into your lap. And the whole experience is just different somehow. It's like the people in the audience aren't really just spectators, they're participants. You know, not passive in the seats. In fact, it's kind of fun to watch the way people will duck and, and dodge and grab and, and grasp at those things as they come their way. But if you ever do take off the glasses there at a 3D movie, you kind of wonder, what's all the excitement about? What, what just happened? I mean, why is everything suddenly so flat and so fuzzy? But you put those glasses back on, and what do you know? Everything, once again, clear and close. And so that's what I mean when I say that tonight's teaching in 1 Peter 4 is going to be in 3D. And so if you don't have a Bible with you, certainly you'll want to raise your hand at this point and get a Bible into your lap. They won't, don't have the glasses, but you won't need them. Because, see, the thing is, it's a three-dimensional thought here. That's really what's happening, that Peter is going to discuss with us the three dimensions of our salvation, the three dimensions of our salvation. And what he's talking about there is the past, the present, and the future. And what I'm praying here tonight is that we will each let those words, these words, leap off the page and right into our lives. That things that might otherwise appear kind of flat and fuzzy in life, well, without God's word, that's the way things can be. But as we look at these things through the lens of God's spirit, that we would see things very clear, very close. And it's my hope again that we would not be passive people in the process, that we would be an active and alert audience, that if a truth comes flying your way, that you would not dodge it, that you would not try to duck it, but that we would all grasp and grab onto these things. So if you're taking notes here tonight, and I would recommend that you do that either in your Bible, on your page there, or maybe just in your mind, but 3D, the first thing that I want to think with you on is the three dimensions of time, the past, the present, and the future. And to put along with that another thought, which is another 3D thing, which is the three dimensions of sin. The three dimensions of sin, well, you see the penalty of sin, you see the power of sin, and you see the presence of sin. And together, if you'll think with these words with me, what you're going to see is that they help paint a picture of Jesus in 3D, our salvation in 3D. How so? Well, just think of it this way. In the past, in our past, this is what we have. Jesus came for the first time into human history to save us from the penalty of sin. That's why he came. And you see, right now, because of the resurrection, because of what we even looked at this weekend as Easter weekend, right now in the present, Jesus is alive today, available today, to save us from the power of sin. And then in the future, well, Jesus is coming again a second time to save us from the very presence of sin. And so a good 3D view there, a good synopsis of the benefits, the blessings that come with being a believer. If you put your faith in Christ here in your life, you are saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved from the power of sin. And you will be delivered from the presence of sin one day. Your past, your present, your future, all very well in hand, taken care of by God. Now, on the other hand, if you think about it this way with me, if you're here in this room or you're hearing my voice tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never made that declaration, you've never made that decision, well, you have a three-dimensional problem. You have sin in 3D, I would say. You know, sin in your past, sin in your present, sin in your future, and it needs to be dealt with. Now, the good news is 
that you are one decision away here tonight from a solution to that 3D sin problem. And tonight can be your night. And if you will see with me here Jesus, maybe in a fresh and new way, in 3D, if you will, well, you know what? You're, you can give your life to him tonight and see that he will change radically everything about you, past, present, and future. And there'll be an invitation, an opportunity to do that here at the end. But just to make sure that we're all on the same page here in the room, again, the teaching title, you see it on the screen here, Jesus in 3D. And Jesus' name literally means, if you don't already know, God saves. That's the meaning of his name. Every name has a meaning behind it, you know. And so you might ask the question right away, God saves what? I mean, from what? And so that's what you see again, that 3D sin problem. Jesus saves us from sin in the past, in the present, in the future. He saves us from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, from the presence of sin. And when Jesus saves a person, it really truly is a three-dimensional event. You see in the New Testament, if you pay close attention, and I would invite you to do that as you read, you'll see throughout the scriptures three different tenses, three different tenses of the verb, to save. It talks about us having been saved. That's in the past. It also says you are being saved. That's in the present. And it many times says, and you will be saved. That's a future thing. And so you see, again, that third dimension, those three dimensions of salvation, a very full understanding of it. And 1 Peter 4, verse 1, if you'll look at it with me, the first word is therefore. Now, I've said this before, but it's very important for us to remember that anytime you see the word therefore, it's not the beginning of a thought, it's the continuation of it. So it points to what came before. What came before, we'll back up a few verses here to 1 Peter 3.18. And you'll see the context of tonight's teaching. And it starts there with the penalty of sin. See, verse 18, if you'll look at it with me, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. That's chapter 3, verse 18. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, what's it saying there? Well, this is the first thing to really burn into your brain tonight. The major point that I want to leave with you first is that the past has passed. That's important for us to see. It may seem very simple. It may seem very simplistic in a way. But remember, the past has passed. And what you see there is that Jesus suffered once. What is it talking about there? It's talking about the cross. It's talking about a point in history that something happened that is finished, that is done, that is complete, that can never be added to or subtracted from. And you see this accomplishment that Jesus had there is that the penalty for sin has been paid in full. It says there that he suffered once for, for what reason? Well, the just for the unjust. And just to make that as clear as I possibly can, the just, who is that? Jesus. Who's the unjust? Well, look around and even look down, because it's, it's us. We are the unjust, you and I. And so a just God, the just one, must judge sin. That's what justice is, to judge correctly, to judge something rightly. And so what God has done as a just judge is given a penalty for sin, and he said sin has a death penalty, the death penalty. That's the severity of sin. Sinners deserve death, and God, well, as the creator, he has the right to put whatever penalty he wants to on sin, and that's what he's done. The penalty of sin, the death penalty. And the full understanding of that scripturally, death is separation, physical and spiritual separation from God. And so as God sets that severe penalty, you also see that Jesus paid that penalty for sin. He paid the death penalty. And you may, as I did sometimes, have heard that enough times that it can lose its impact. You know, that in some way or another, you can hear Jesus died for our sins. And I knew, I grew up hearing that often. You know, went to church a lot, heard it many times. And I said, yeah, that's interesting. That's cool. I guess I'll just go on sinning, you know, because he paid the penalty for it. So that lets me off the hook anyway. You know, I had kind of that cavalier attitude toward, toward it. Now, what you see is he did it for a reason which was in verse 18 there. It says, to bring me to God, to bring you and I to God. And what this means is that if we have come to Christ, if we have accepted the price paid on our behalf, 
through faith. It says there that we are no longer spiritually separated from God, that we will never be, in fact, that there's nothing that can come between us and him. And so, again, I remind you, what was it? That Jesus came to save us from the penalty of sin. And the more we understand the severity of sin, the penalty paid, the more we will understand what an amazing and wonderful thing that is. But a lot of people start, stop right there when they're understanding. It's kind of one-dimensional. Oh, Jesus paid the penalty. All right, what else is there? Well, there's so much more. See, that in and of itself would be amazing by itself. But Jesus does much more, and that's why I say tonight, we're looking at salvation in 3D, in three dimensions. The first dimension, it was the past there, that Jesus saved me from the penalty of my sin. But there's a second dimension that we need to talk about, which is the present, the here and now, what we're doing right now. And, and Jesus is saving me, the Bible says, in this very moment. Now, when you think about that, what is he doing? He's saving me, not from the penalty of sin, that's already been taken care of, but he's saving me right now from the power of sin, practically, in my life right now. And that same power is effective and available to every Christian. Now, this is what we're going to see as Peter hits it here in chapter 4, verse 1. And we're going to see that Christ suffered for us, it says, in the flesh. And because of that, we need to arm ourselves with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And again, trying to paint for you, trying to help all of us to understand the severity of sin, just put yourself in the picture for just a moment. I think this really helps. Imagine yourself, if you will, on death row. Again, I say the penalty of sin, death. And so imagine yourself on death row with all of the um, emotional content of that, and the day has arrived for your penalty to be paid, and there you are being sat down into the seat, and they are going to start putting the needles into you and all the rest so that you can receive the penalty, the consequence of your choices. And right as they are about to let the poison start flowing and you're about to go, they stop the whole procedure and they say, hey, there's a guy who has agreed to take your place. There's somebody who's going to die in your place. Now, he's innocent. He didn't do anything. But he's going to sit in that seat and he's going to pay the penalty that you have. That is the reality of what Jesus did a million times over in our lives, that he might bring us to God. So again, thinking about this, Christ suffered for us. He says, crucified in our place, even worse than death just by injection. What you see there is, he says, arm yourself with the same mind, the same mind that Jesus had when he offered himself for our sin. What's it saying? Well, the penalty has been paid. We've seen that. The second half of the verse there, though, opens up something so important for us to see. It describes the power over sin that's available to all of us right now. So again, reviewing it, the past is the past. It has passed. It's important for us to see that. That's a freedom that we need to live in. God knows we need to live in that freedom. We are not prisoners of our past. Sometimes people want to make us that. Well, you've always been this. You'll always be that. Or, you know, you were brought up this way and it's got to affect you for the rest of your life and you're a prisoner of that. Not true. The past has passed. We are not prisoners of the past. The penalty's been paid. But you see now, the power of sin can be broken practically in our lives. We do not have to live under that taskmaster master any longer. And that's the second thought that's brought out here. The present is a present. Now, if you write this down, again, in that way, maybe you'll remember it. The present is a present. What do I mean by that? A present, a gift from God. See, when I think about it, my past is something that I am glad is past. But I really don't want the present to just pass because, man, I'm enjoying the life that God has given me in Christ. It's a whole different way of living. And so you see this second dimension here. Salvation is something God wants for all of us right here, right now, in the present, daily basis, a victory over the sin that once held us so captive. And to see that different way of living. Now, again, verse 1, it's found in that phrase, arm yourself. The word picture there is of a soldier who is going to put on armor, somebody who is going to prepare themselves for battle. What does that show us? Well, even though Jesus won the war over death there on the cross, that doesn't mean there aren't still some skirmishes. <laughs> there, there isn't some after-the-fact things going on. Now, again, it's a one war. 
Jesus won the war against death. But the bottom line is we still need to arm ourselves for the battles that will happen practically through the remainder of our life. And what do we need for that? He says we need to arm our mind. Again, it's not an external armor. It's an internal armor. A willingness to do what? Well, what was the mind of Christ? We saw it here. We see it in Philippians 2. If you want to write that down as a cross-reference and look at it later, it specifically says that Jesus was obedient, willing to suffer even unto death rather than to sin. Rather than to turn against the will of God, he was willing to to suffer. So how can we think of that here tonight? Just think of it this way. Jesus was a man who would rather suffer than sin. Now that right away puts him in a rare category, right? Because most people would far rather sin than suffer. I mean, like given the choice, okay, lie or die. They go, well, you know, a little lie never hurt anyone. Deny or die. Well, you know, a little denial. I can always change my mind later or whatever. But Jesus was a man who paid a very high price for not sinning. You know, he lived a righteous life and he surrendered his will to the will of the Father. And in that process, what did he get? Well, he got the mockery of men. He got the cruelty of the cross. And our natural inclination, again, I know mine is, is to avoid pain, to do whatever I can do to get away from suffering, even if it meant sin. Well, hey, I'll sin if I don't have to suffer. But you see, arming ourselves is to arm ourselves with a mentality that you say, you know what, sin is so serious. Sin is such a mess. Look what it did to my Lord. Look what it does to the lives of those I love. Look what it has done to me that I now have the mentality. I've set the decision, settled the issue that I'm going to live my life for the will of God, not for the will of Scott any longer. And when faced with a choice, and we get this choice all the time, to either sin or suffer. You know what? I'd rather suffer than sin. If I got that choice, that's what I'm going to do, arming myself with that decision. One who's willing to suffer even some of the rejection, some of the difficulty, some of the challenges that come into a life when that person wants to live a righteous life. That's when we have this power of sin broken in our life. See, this is what he's saying in verse 2. If you'll look at it with me, he says that he, talking about us, whoever that person was, would no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. He's talking about the will of the wicked there. He says, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Now, Thinking about that list there, I like the word abominable. You know, just saying it makes me happy. But abominable snowman, that's what immediately comes to everyone's mind, right? But he's talking here about the abominable sin man. You know, just somebody who is into sex, drugs, rock and roll, and whatever else. And as we read a list like this, there's two reactions that people have. Some people in the room are saying, yep, that's a great description of my life in the past. Others are saying, I never did those things. I was never abominable, you know. But here's the thing. Sin comes in all shapes and sizes. And God sees sin so differently than we did. See, Peter could very easily have put in this list, and elsewhere he does, sins that are not so obvious. Sins that are not so abominable even to us, you know. Some that we can say, that's kind of cute, you know materialism or self-centeredness or self-pity and all those things, or even self-righteousness that looks at a list like drinking parties, revelry, drunkenness, and abominable idolatries and says, well, I was never that bad. But what you see here is Peter, his point is not the specific sin or even the severity and obviousness of the sin. Again, I remind you for your notes, for our minds, that the past has passed. That's what he's trying to get us to remember and the present is a present. And what should we do with the present of the present? Well, not live it like we used to. Not live it with the same mentality we've always had. See, Jesus didn't pay the penalty of our sins so that we could go on living our life exactly the same as we did before. That would have been a waste. No, what he really died for was to break the power of sin in our lives because sin destroys lives. And God loves people and looking at our lives in sin and and out of sin is a totally different thing see jesus came to set us totally free and so jesus makes it very clear 
in his life, that that's what he came to do. And Peter here is saying, hey, you know, unrestrained sin, if it's not part of your past, then there's something wrong. You know, there is something wrong if this is really a description of your present. It needs to be part of your past, not part of your present. And so let's bring the point real close, real clear. Thinking about this, you know, everyone's heard of DUI, right? What DUI is. Well, let me give you another little acronym here, which is LUI. What's LUI? Living under the influence. See, we're all living under the influence of something, right? And what you see in this section is people who are living under intoxication, the intoxication of sin. And look at the connection, if you look at that list there, that is tying together in verse 3, intoxication with immorality. Now, again, I don't mean to bring up the past since it's past, you know, but let's think about it sometimes. I know some of the biggest regrets I have in my life were times when I was under the influence of something else that caused me to be much more willing to do a bunch of stuff I knew was wrong. And then I came to, you know, say, oh man, I was under the influence of something. You blame it on that. But then you see what he's saying, that contrast, Ephesians 5.18, if you look it up later, it says to be living under the influence, not of alcohol, not of intoxicants, but under the influence, L-U-I, living under the influence of God's Holy Spirit. And in doing that, instead of being out of control, your life will be in control. Your life will be with self-control and the fruit of the Spirit, all of those things. And so a, a person who has truly been saved from the penalty of sin, well, guess what? Again, it's a package deal. It's a three-dimensional deal, and in time, very clearly, Jesus is going to increasingly set a person free from the power of sin. Let me give you a, a scripture to think through here. We'll put it up here on the screen, I believe. It's 1 John 3, 9. This is an important verse to know. It says, no one who's born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him, and he cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. Now, Treating that one in its full context, which I should and we do, hey, it's not talking about sinless perfection here. It's not saying you'll never make a mistake after you come to Christ. No, quite the opposite. But what it does say is that there's no way your life can go on after Christ exactly like it was before Christ. Or else, well, there's maybe a false profession there or a false understanding of what it really is to come to Christ. Because he didn't just die for the penalty of sin. He died to set us free from the power of sin and that is available to us so sin will be a part of my life a part of your life as long as i'm here on this earth there will be a struggle there'll be a battle that is very clear that's why he said you have to arm yourself there'll be a battle of wills but there will be a new power available to a person who has given their life to christ what the power of christ who was able to say no to sin, and he wants to live his life through us, an obedient life. And that is his present to us. I love it. You know, the grace gift that God gives. What does grace give? The power to change. Oh, man, there's something I was missing in my life and sorely missing. The power to change. I had desire sometimes to change. Other people in my life had desire for me to change. But without Christ, I never ran into the power to change. And see, there are maybe some still under the power of sin, and you know what happens to them? Well, when they look on and see change in someone else's life, they find that change strange. You see it in verse 4. It says, in regard to these, he's talking about the folks you used to party with. He says, they think it's strange <laughs> that you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. They'll give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, again, as he says they, he's making a contrast between us and them. Now, the thing to always remember is I was a them for most of my life. You know, it's not like I am better than anybody. I'm not better than anyone. Jesus is better than anyone. And that's the point here. He says, you know, your former sinning buddies, you know, your old partners in crime, they wonder why you're changing. They think it's strange that you've changed. And so he talks about a flood of dissipation. I love the King James Version, which says... A riot of excess. Anybody think, wow, that, yeah, I can remember those. Riot of excess, you know. But that's what they're saying. They're saying, hey, we're having a riot of excess this weekend. You want to come? No, man, I'm just going to have my own kind of quiet riot here, you know. 
Oh, man, you're no fun anymore. What, are you going to go to the church again You know, on a Wednesday night? I mean, come on! And it's a great irony because you know what they do? They start speaking evil of you when you stop doing evil. Isn't that weird? It seems weird. Think they're so holy, too good for us sinners, I guess, you know? Found religion, probably judging me. No, you know, I don't. We're not to judge others, but that's what he says here. There is going to be a judge. There's going to be a just judge with the same standard for all of us. And you see, there's only two choices, which is Jesus as Savior or Jesus as Judge. Which one do you like? Well, I like him as Savior a whole lot more than I like him as Judge because I know I've done things that need judgment. And so you think about that, I need salvation as a result. And if Jesus is not your Savior here tonight, he will be your Judge. If, if you... Leave him only that option. See, he does not want to be anyone's judge. The Bible says he takes pleasure in the death of no one. There isn't anyone that goes, ha, I've been waiting to judge that one. No, that's not at all his heart. He wants to be your savior, but that's a decision he's left up to you. And so for this reason, the verse 6 there says the gospel was preached, just as it's being done right now here at Calvary Kendall. What is the gospel? The good news that Jesus came to save sinners. To those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in their flesh, but according to God in the Spirit. In other words, that there might be change in their life. And look at verse 7. This is a big corner turner in this teaching. This is where Peter's really getting into that third dimension. He says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. In other words, connect with God. Make it a priority. And he says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Now, thinking again at verse 7 there, the end of all things is at hand. Now, anytime I, I hear this, you know, I kind of have that picture of that guy with the big long beard and, you know, the end is near sign and all that. And people go, oh boy, another weirdo for Jesus or whatever, you know. But here's Peter, you know, in his right mind, just saying, reminding us, hey, close. It's very, very close. The coming of Christ is close, right in front of us. Like that 3D image, you know, that goes, whoa, and you, it's right there. It's right in your face. And that's the third dimension of salvation that Peter is wanting us to see here, that the future is near. It's so near, it's here, really. The end is near. Now, some with an analytical mind right away would say, wait, 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 wait a minute. Peter wrote this quite a while ago, didn't he? I mean, was Peter wrong? Well, no, not at all. Remember, all generations need to live in the expectation that they are the ones who will see Jesus come again. That's what he told us. He said, nobody knows the hour or day, but you need to be ready. You need to realize that it's right at hand at any moment. That's the clear teaching of Jesus, to quote from a movie, I'll be back. You know, he was the first one to do that. Now, Jesus, think about this for a minute. The Bible says a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. You know, God has a different view of things. When you're eternal, you know, I suppose things don't go on the same schedule as, as ours. But if he were to tarry for another thousand years, you know, even, I won't. I know that much. You know, I don't have another thousand years uh, left in the tank here, you know. I won't tarry that long, even if Jesus does, and neither will you. You know, we're all going to see him in our lifetime. You know what I'm saying? Every last one of you will see Jesus in your lifetime. You know that for sure. My personal end of all things could be any moment. Could come at any time, or eternity's a breath away for every one of us. Now, how can we know that we're living in this expectation? How can we know whether this is really a practical part of our Christianity? Well, the Bible says something very interesting, which it says, basically, if you're living for eternity, it's going to change your now. It's going to change the way you view now a lot of different things. And one of the things that's so clear here is it says it's going to give you two priorities, love for God, a passionate love for God. If you're living for eternity, you're going to realize, I only got a little while on this earth to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and strength before I see him face to face. And it's also going to affect how you treat others. You're going to have a passionate love for others in the present. 
See, that's again the, the realization, and I've just been thinking it through this week in such a personal way. The present is a present. Thank you, God, for the present, for right now, for this moment. This is all I have right now. Thank you that you, the past is the past, that you've forgiven and forgotten a lot of things in my life. But right now, thank you for what you've given me. This little minute here. It's a gift. It's a present. And it's a present we all have. I can't get the past back, you know, even if I wanted to. Some of us say, let me rewind the tape and make a different decision here or there. I can't do that. What can I do? I can do something right now. There's no guarantee of a tomorrow for any one of us. So what do I have? I have right now. That's the present that God has given me, the present. And it's a present from God. And what should I do with a gift from God? What should I do with it? Well, that's what he's going to talk about right here. He says, the greatest gift that you can give is love, the love that God has given you. And love each other with that gift. And sometimes, again, the simplest things are the most profound, aren't they? The word fervent here, it means this. It was the word that they would use in the Greek for a runner in a race, you know, for the Olympics there. As they were just about to reach the finish line, they'd say, that guy is running fervently. You know how it is where you, like, kind of duff four laps or something like that, but at the end, everybody kind of sprints for the last part. And that's what he's saying right there. The end is near. The finish line is right there in front of you. I mean, the future is near now. He says, love each other fervently. There isn't enough time for anything else. Knowing we're almost done, knowing that we're on our last lap, you know, so to speak, that the race is almost over, that the end is near, it ought to change the way we treat today and how we treat people today. See, I was reminded of that truth the other day that pass, time is passing quickly. You know, it was kind of in a funny way, although it was almost humiliating too. And that is our daughter, Carissa. She's now eight years old. She's growing up, changing quickly. We've stayed the same, of course. But we were there talking. I was talking with my eight-year-old, you know, about the challenges of growing up. Because she was saying, well, you know, the two older kids, and, and then she's the, the younger one, all this stuff. And I said, well, you know, you'll be a teenager before you know it. And she told me, do you remember what it's like to be a teenager? I said, yeah, baby, I was 17 once. She looked at me and she said, that ship has sailed. <laughs> now, I was like, I don't know where she heard that, but I actually told her, you know what, actually, honey, the, the truth is that ship has probably sunk. You know, that's the, that's the truth. It hadn't just sailed. It is at the bottom. But... The present is such a present, and, 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 and thinking about this, it's all we have. Time is running out, and God says, in that time that you have left, love each other fervently. Race for that finish line with that. You don't have time for a bunch of other distractions and side trips, and love will cover a multitude of sins. That's what you see here. That doesn't mean we never confront sins, you know, that we just brush them under the rug and everything, oh, all in the name of love, you know, never deal with reality. No, this is what it means. We cannot wait for the people in our lives to be lovable before we love them. That's what it means. If you're waiting for the people in your life to be lovable and they're waiting for you, you'll be waiting for all eternity. Because that's the only time when we are going to be truly lovable is in all eternity as we come to be perfect, as God perfects and finishes the work in us. But along the way, we need to do what Jesus did for us, which is love us when we were unlovable. That's what the Bible teaches, that why we were yet Sinners, while we were yet messed up, he loved us. This is what it means to me. It means love does not inspect and dissect. Think of those two words. I don't know if you remember back to science class, and uh, you know, this was one of my least favorite subjects in it, you know, where they brought the frog in. And you had to dissect that frog and inspect it. Now, it, it was pretty gross frankly, you know, but here's the thing. We did have some fun in that whole process because we would inspect everything. I mean, we would look at our hands underneath the microscope. I remember the, the teacher having us wash our hands really, really well and then look at our hand under the microscope and we were like, <gasps> man, it looked like the Sahara Desert or something. It was, ah, you know, there's cracks and dirt and stuff in it. And you, and you go, I eat with that hand? You know, I just had lunch with that. You know, there's crazy things in it, you know, and you, Everything looks bad under the microscope. I do a lot of relationship counsel, and that's one of the illustrations I always use. You know what? If you put people in your life under the microscope, they're history. Nobody looks good under the microscope. Not us, not anybody. And so 
It means that love doesn't do that, you know. And what that means in my life anyway, in our life, is that you will never hear about my wife's flaws through me. Now, she has two. I'm just going to tell you that. <laughs> she has two. But you'll have to ask her what they are. Now, what does it mean? It means love's like a shock absorber. It, it smooths over a lot of problems in our life. When we are loving like Christ did, loving the unlovable, realizing, hey, time's way too short to just go around finding flaws with everyone, especially the people closest to me. I don't have time for that. It smooths out the bumps. I used to have a car that had like no shocks. It was the original lowrider, but it wasn't because I was being cool. It was because I had all the money I had and shocks were not in the budget. And so, you know, it was an amazing thing once when I got like a modern car that actually had shocks and I would go over potholes and I didn't even feel them. I'd go over speed bumps, you know, and I, my fillings didn't fall out. You know, I was like, wow, shock absorbers. Love like that in our lives. So he says there in verse 9, again, talking about our present. What should we do with our present? Look at it. It says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Don't just, you know, help people, but, you know, don't make sure that you know, they know how horrible it is to help them. He says, now, as each one has received a gift, poor me, you know, as I'm helping you, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, usually amen means the end. It doesn't in this case. It just means so be it. And so you might wonder, why is Peter putting a discussion of service right in the middle of this book, which is so much about suffering and dealing with the realities of life and the challenges of life? Well, I think you know if you've ever tried to be hospitable without grumbling or you've ever tried to minister some gift that God has given you to others, anyone who serves will sometimes suffer a little extra as a result of that. You know, over time, this is certainly something I've seen, is that a lot of Christians back down when the heat is on. You know, I mean, it's like you start to serve and all of a sudden it's like all hell breaks loose. Yes, because hell doesn't like serving servants. You know, people who actually do something with the gifts that God has given to them. And the going gets tough and people say, whoa, better back off. Now, I can't think of this without thinking of a very good friend of mine who has MS, you know, and he is confined to a wheelchair. It has progressed to that stage where he generally is not even able to get out of the chair. Now, this is the thing. As I got to watch him go through that and the digression there, really, all the while, very active serving the Lord. I would watch him sometimes carrying things and dragging his foot, you know, behind him in constant pain, not just the pain physically, but sometimes that emotional frustration that comes with having a limitation that you wish you could do more than you really can. And yet I see this guy, again, has gone on mission trips. A guy who was an active evangelist sharing his faith with people. And a guy who now has started a Bible study and pastoring a church from a wheelchair. Now, thinking about that, again, he has every excuse, doesn't he? to sit on the sideline and say, hey, somebody serve me, you know? And yet I've seen his fervency. You know, not a person to say, well, Lord, I, if this is how you treat your servants, I'm just going to sit down and stop serving. No. Again, he realizes that number two dimension there of salvation, which is the present is a present. It's given to us from God, and whatever he's given us, whether it be much or little, we give it back to Him. See, we were saved from sin for service. That's an important little phrase to think about here tonight. Saved from sin for service. I don't know about you, but sin takes a lot of time and effort. I mean, it used to in my life. You know, I, planning it, you know, preparing for it, get, recovering from it, all those things. It takes a lot of time and effort to serve sin and self. So what do you do with the extra energy and time now? Well, the Bible says here, each one has received a gift from God. What do we do with that gift? You give it back to God. Now, remember this. God has need of nothing. So how do I give something back to God? Well, he says, I'll tell you what. Here's how. The gift I gave you, use it for the benefit of somebody else. Somebody who does need it. And if you're not actively 
in some way. It doesn't have to be within these walls because this is just the preparation for our service in many cases. It can be that you serve here, but there's a world to serve out there as well. But if you're not actively using the gifts that God has given you for others, here's what's happening. You are ripping off the body of Christ. You are wasting a gift that God has given. Now, that can be a pretty strong statement, but I want you to think about it, that the person next to you is diminished, is missing out on something if you are not using that gift for the benefit of others. If you can sing, if you can play an instrument, if you can cook, if you can act, if you can draw, if you can teach, if you can write, you know, if you can organize, if you can clean, whatever it is, it goes on and on and on. I always hear people who say, well, I only know how to do this, and how could God use that? And yet you look around and you see somebody else using that same gift for the glory of God. See, that's why he talks about manifold grace. Now, if you have an automotive background, maybe you have manifold grace. You know, you can work on the exhaust manifold or the intake manifold or whatever else, but what manifold means is multicolored. It means varied. God is a God of variety. He doesn't make any two people alike because he doesn't give any two gifts alike. And usually we look at somebody who's got a gift and I go, well, I don't have that, so I don't have anything. No, what you don't have is the gift and calling that that person does. But that doesn't mean you don't have a gift or a calling. And so I like to think back to a movie here, Chariots of Fire. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It wasn't in 3D. That'd be interesting, kind of. I know it's his long legs came out toward you and stuff like that. But it was about a Christian Olympic runner. You may remember that. And there was a scene in that movie where someone was questioning him because he kind of faced a choice between direct spiritual ministry in his life. He was a Christian. And there were people who even found fault at the time with the fact that he was pursuing running, that it was just, that's all you do? You're a runner? Why don't you serve God with something spiritual? You know? And this is what he said to them. All I know is this, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. I love that. What a freeing thing that is. What did God make you? Well, God made me slow. Okay, well, maybe you're supposed to uh, not be an Olympic runner. You know, maybe you're supposed to be someone who walks alongside people who are recovering from injuries, you know, and needs somebody a little slower there. But I often ask people when they come to us as pastors and say, what is God's gift? What is God's calling? I say, what makes you unique? Just think about it for a minute. What can you do that you go, oh, that's easy. That's nothing. That's probably something. That's probably the very thing that God's gifted you in because it's so weird. You know, you see people who do these crazy acrobatic things on skates or something. They go, it's easy. No, it's easy for you because you're gifted in that, you know. Somebody will just open their mouth and sing and you think, well, it's easy. Well, it's easy for you because it's the gift that God has given you. And so you think about those things. It doesn't mean you're not going to have to stir it up. See, common mistakes that people make is they think, well, if, if it's not already mature, if it's not already so easy that I just do it and I don't have to get outside my comfort zone, well, that's a much different thing. See, a lot of people use their gifts for their own glory. That's a big mistake. It doesn't say there that you would use your gift for you. God gave it to you, not, he gave it to you, but for others and for his glory. And so not using it at all is such a mistake. You know, putting it in a jar and doing what Jesus said there was somebody burying their talent. I like to think of chocolate milk. You know, it's one of the things I love. The kids do, love it too. But if you let chocolate milk sit, all the sweet stuff's in there, but it's all at the bottom. And sometimes I look at Christian lives and I say, that's like chocolate milk that sat too long. You know, you sit too long, you don't, serve, you don't stir it up. It's just all the sweet stuff's at the bottom. It's in there, it's just waiting to be stirred up, waiting for somebody to come along and do something with it. And so, you know, I think about this. Many heathens are very fervent in their pursuit of sin, aren't they? Again, maybe you know some, maybe you were some. I knew a guy in high school, you know, he could make a pot pipe, he could make a bong, out of absolutely anything. I mean, anything. We'd be sitting somewhere and he'd so I could make a bong out of that. And well, what? I mean, the guy just, and he would. He would make these incredible creations, but all for sin. That was his whole deal. Now, I learned a lesson from him, learned a lot of lessons, good and bad, but one of them was his fervency, his creativity. And it always makes me crazy when I see people creative and fervent for sin, and then they come to Christ and it's like, Ugh. Where'd that go? Man, the present is the present. We don't have time to just say, well, I gave my best 
to my past, to my sinful past. And I got energy for the little time I got left. And so Peter here returns to the subject of suffering. And he's really going to focus on that future, on that nearness of the future, the third dimension of salvation. Let's look at it. He says, verse 12, Beloved, don't think it strange. <laughs> don't be surprised, in other words. This isn't weird. It isn't unexpected concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. You know, we always go, well, ha, ha, happened. And what, uh, something we should expect. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, see, that's a future thing there, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So Peter, a guy who suffered was suffering, speaking to suffering people. If you're speaking to people, you're speaking to suffering people. It's just the truth. All in different dimensions. But you see, he says, don't think it's strange. Don't say, why me? <laughs> why, why not me? Why should I be spared? Jesus wasn't even spared. The fiery trial. Not just a trial. He even puts that modifier on it. Ooh, does it have to be a fiery trial? Can I just have like a little, you know, lukewarm one? Does it have to be fiery? But you see this third dimension here. The future is near. The future is here, really. And that means so soon, all of that's going to be behind us. Jesus is coming back to save us from the very presence of sin. It's so good to remember that. This is just such a short time here. The hope of Christianity, sometimes people lose sight of this. You know, they start teaching salvation as if it was all what God wanted to do right here in your life. And he wants to just bless your life and bring all abundance into your life. And you go, wait a minute. He wants to bring abundance into your life, but he wants to prepare you for eternal life. And sometimes that means it's not all about what happens here that's so wonderful. See, the end of all things here on earth is, is very soon. And the beginning of eternity, that's all it really means. The presence of God, yeah, we're going to be free from sin and the suffering and all those things. But Jesus said, while you're here, no, there's going to be fiery trials in abundance. This is the great news. All of those trials are for us to pass, not to fail. And verse 13 says, if I'm like Jesus in his sufferings in the present, guess what? I get to participate in his glories in the future. What does that mean? Exceeding joy. That there's going to be a time when the very thing that caused the pain will actually be something that we rejoice in. I like to think of babies that way, you know. There's a baby born and the baby caused the pain and then the baby, the same exact baby, causes the rejoicing. It's, it's like it's, there's a transformation there, you know. You hear about doctors slapping babies, you know, there. I've never heard of a mom slapping the baby. Maybe slapping the dad, you know. But, <laughs> but they rejoice that that very thing that just caused them pain, it's like it's forgotten moments after that. And hey, exceeding joy, replaced by it. That's what God says. The trials of our life are going to be just like that. They're going to be the very thing that later we look back and go, Oh, that was good. It looked bad. Now you see verse 14. He says, If you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and God rests upon you. On their part, he's talking about those who would persecute you for your faith. He said, they're, God's blaspheme. That's what they do. But on your part, God gets glory out of it. I love to think about this with us here. He talks about the suffering that can come, and, and he says, you're not going to rejoice in the suffering. I mean, that's sickness. You know, it's, that's masochism. That's just wrong. Peter wasn't saying, oh, hurt me, hit me again, Lord. I love it. <laughs> yeah, bring it on, you know. That's what, that, that person needs help. But what he says is, we rejoice in the reason for it and the result of it. The reason for it, the reason is we are looking like Christ. We're living like Christ. He said, when that's true, the same things that went on in his life are going to go on in yours. What does that mean? There's going to be a lot of people who love you. And I think about this, since coming to Christ, I don't know, there's a lot of people who love me for his sake, apparently, because I have never received the level of love that I have in my life since coming to Christ. But Along with that, there's going to be people who dislike you and disagree with you and come against you for the very same Christ. And the way that they treated him, sometimes they will treat us. And so he says, that's okay. You can rejoice in that reason for persecution. But he says, you can also rejoice in the result. What's the result? That our light and momentary troubles are gaining for us, the Bible says, a weight of glory that far exceeds them all. In other words, it won't be easy, but it will be worth it in that future glory. 
Now, what does fire do? He talks about a fiery trial. It takes away the temporary. It burns it away. And what's left? The purified, permanent things. That's what God is doing in our lives through trial. He says, let none of you suffer, verse 15, as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody. You know, it's kind of interesting that um, he puts murderers and meddlers in the same category there. But he says, verse 16, if you suffer... If you suffer as a Christian, in other words, if you suffer for doing the right things instead of being uh, wrong about things, he says, don't be ashamed about that. There's nothing to be ashamed if people are coming against you for your Christianity. Glorify God in this manner. Verse 17, it says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? And verse 19 finishes out there. It says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God ever ask, what's the will of God for me? Well, part of it's right here, that we would suffer. Oops, you know, highlight that with a black pen so I can't read it. Uh, commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Again, as we think through that and kind of summarize it down, this is it, salvation in 3D tonight. You know, don't just hang up on the God has forgiven me of my sins in the past. That's a wonderful thing. But there's so much more to the Christian life than that. The past, the present, the future. Jesus didn't just, you know, whisk me into eternity the minute I got saved and say, well, the, uh, there it is, finished, done. You know, there's something he's doing. Right now, he's accomplishing something in me and he's accomplishing something through me. Same thing in your life. There are things that God is still doing with us. And so he's in the process of teaching me how to be getting the victory over sin's power in my life right now. You know, Areas of sin that maybe some of the easy ones were out of the way years ago, but some of those lagging ones, he's like, I'm going to show you this year the power over that one. And you're going to learn it by messing it up several times, you know? I'm growing, I'm learning, and I hope everyone in this room can say that same thing, that you'd say I'm more mature spiritually than I was last year, than I was last month, than I was last week. And if I get another day as a present, hey, I want to be more mature tomorrow than I am today. Now, as long as this physical body is here for us, we're never going to be sinless, but we can sin less and less, and it can have less and less of a hold over our lives. That's salvation in 3D. That is the full picture that God wanted us to understand. Jesus in 3D. My past, man, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I will never be separated from God ever. Not in this life, never in all eternity. In my present, man, I am being set free from the power of sin. My, my life is not being dragged down by all those things that once held me. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Oh, far from it. But I'm not what I used to be, and I'm not what I'm going to be tomorrow if I get that day. What could be better than that? Well, there is something better than that. That third dimension that we talked about tonight, which is the future, that is so very near, so very here, which is that before the blink of an eye, Jesus will save me from the very presence of sin. That means I'm never going to pick up the newspaper in heaven and see something that breaks my heart one more time. You know, that the past is past. That the present was a present for me to live, but the future is now here. And that's great news. Why? Because for Christians, man, the future's so bright. We got to wear shades, man. <laughs> now, I remind you, I am enjoying this life. I hope you are too. I love my friends. I love my family. But I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> I really. You know, there's such a close connection between sin and suffering. And listen, this world is sin-soaked and suffering. And sometimes people blame that on God. But remember, God was the faithful creator. He created us one way, but there was something that came in, sin. And sometimes we suffer directly the consequences of our sin. I'm sure there's some in here who could say, I... I can point to one of those in my own life. Yeah, probably so, probably more than one. But sometimes we suffer because we didn't sin. You know, we say, well, I'm not going to sin. And there's a suffering that can come in with that. But sometimes we just suffer as innocent people, so to speak. Someone who said, I, I had nothing to do with that. It just happened. Someone else's sin happened to me. 
But the great thing is that when we're a believer, the thing we know is that the three dimensions of salvation are, man, that my past doesn't have to keep me prisoner. My present can be a present, even if it's not absent of problems and difficulties, and there will soon come a time when that's all going to be behind me, and the only thing left is going to be the permanent stuff that came out of that. Now, many of you know our son Stephen, you know, uh, I gave a teaching just a few weeks back about the leg lengthening surgery that he's going through, and uh, if you didn't hear that, I'd invite you to, to hear it, because it's, uh, it's, I think there's some things in it, but just a little update, because a lot of you have asked, you know, and I, I just want to be faithful, because I know many of you are praying about it. Um, we're all being stretched, let's face it. <laughs> when, I, when I think about that, we're all being stretched and uh, growing so much. And today, the last 24 hours were particularly uh, difficult in it. But we were up in the middle of the night last night, you know. Stephen's leg was uh, cramping, you know. He, he, went, he was up reading at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, which is not a typical thing for him. But I woke up, uh, I didn't even hear something, I don't know, I think the Lord woke me up, really. And I saw his light on, so I went in to see how he's doing. And he was reading there an autobiography. We got him some, some library books that we thought might be encouraging to him. This one is the autobiography of Tony Dungy. Now, some of you know who that is, famous football coach. Uh, he's a Christian, a very vocal Christian, very active Christian. And What's great about this is Stephen's here telling me this story that he had just read, that he had just read at 2 o'clock in the morning. I want to share it with you, that Coach Tony and his wife there, they adopted a baby. They already had a family, but they adopted a baby at one point. And soon after, they found out that this baby was missing a certain gene, okay? Unable to feel pain. That's, that's the result of it. Just no pain, no matter what. And the coach and his family, they told the story here of how they were baking chocolate chip cookies at one point, and the toddler reached in to the oven, grabbed a cookie, and just stuffed it right in his mouth. And they had to go to the emergency room as a result of this. Burns real severe on the, hand, uh, on the hands and, and mouth. From eating a burning cookie, all the while feeling no pain. Now, this is what Stephen said to me, 2 o'clock in the morning. Again, Pastor Scott being schooled by his son. Awake in the middle of the night, he's got wires, he's got rods to his bone, he's facing months of frustration, setbacks here and there, sitting and asking God, he told me, why pain, God? Why is there pain? I wish I, wish I couldn't feel pain. And he's thinking, maybe I'll read this book. He picks up the book and reads that very story and tells me after it, you know what, God, as I'm sitting there on his bedside, you know what, Dan? Pain's actually a gift from God. 14-year-old kid, Took me a lot of years to figure that out. I'm not even sure I still understand it. Quote from the book here, just to share it with you, this is what Stephen reads me. Pain prompts us to change behavior that's destructive to us and to others. Pain can be a very effective teacher sometimes. And you think about what Peter was teaching us through pain, through this book here. He says, verse 18, scarcely saved. Think about that for a minute with me. What does that mean? I mean, I, I, I thought about it. It says that even the righteous are scarcely saved. What's that mean? It means look at what Jesus had to go through, what God had to go through to save even people who would respond to him. It wasn't just a, oh, hey, a blood donation or whatever, you know. I'll just write a little something for you, a little prescription. No, he went to the cross for it. And look what we have to go through as believers to have that progress in our lives sometimes, to progress in our salvation, to grow up in our salvation. A battle of wills that whole while. And he says there, verse 17, judgment begins with the house of God. What does that mean? Well, again, the same thought there. He's saying, you know what? God doesn't spare his children's suffering. <laughs> it starts with us sometimes. Sometimes he says, let me deal with you first. Let me deal with you first. Why? Why? Well, because there's a real purpose in our suffering. See, everybody suffers, believers and non-believers. But what's true here is that if we live a godly life, if we have a holy life, if we have a desire to do that, well, God says, I won't waste that suffering. I, that won't be wasted. It won't be pain upon pain. And so he says, commit yourself to a faithful creator. And that's what I want to encourage you all to do here tonight, all of us, that we would f commit ourselves to a faithful creator. It's an issue of trust, really, when I think about it. Do I trust God with my past? Well, that one's maybe easier. Yeah, Lord, you can have all that sin. <laughs> I trust you. Take care of that. But 
Do I trust him with my present? Oh, no, that one's getting a little harder. Do I trust him with my uncertain future? Well, no, now we're really talking something different. But God says all of those, the three dimensions of your salvation, I want you to trust me with all of them, and you can. See, God created us. He's a faithful creator, but this is even better. He's a faithful recreator. And there is some pain in that process of being recreated, right? I mean, when he looks at our life and says, whoa, marred by sin, not what I intended. I'm going to have to break it down and do it over again in your life. But that means, hey, the past has passed. The present is a present. God's doing something right now as he's doing that. And the future is, again, so bright. It's, now, maybe you're here today and that's not the case for you. You know, you look at it and you say, well, all of those th things sound wonderful, but I've never committed myself to a faithful creator. You know, I maybe have a concept of God or have believed in the man upstairs or any of those types of things, but man, when you bring Jesus into 3D like that, when you bring it down to the fact that God came as a man and walked this earth and died for our sins, personally put himself in our place, that he says, hey, that if you will accept that, if you will accept me into your heart, I'll live my life through you. If that's a transaction you've never made, well, those things can't be said of you. you your past is not past. Your present is not a present, really. And your future is certainly not bright. And so, tonight, that can all change. This is a great thing. It's not three decisions away. It's one D. One decision away. The decision to commit yourself to a faithful creator. How do you do it? Well, we're going to close out tonight just by bowing our heads, closing our eyes. And I'm just going to ask you, wherever you are, if that's your need, if you know, hey, I need to commit my life to Christ. I want to follow him. I need my sin forgiven. I need my life given power over sin. And I want to know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, that my future is secure. I'm just going to ask you, wherever you're sitting, to go ahead and raise your hand. I'll lead you in a prayer to commit your life to him. I see you here. God bless you. Anyone else here tonight? Anyone else? Just get your hand up high. I'll lead you in that prayer. Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sin. And I pray that you would come into my heart in a real and powerful way. Lord, I commit my past to you. I commit my present to you. And I trust you for my future. And God, I pray that you would take my life, the gift that you've given me of life, and make it a gift to others that I might serve you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.